Good afternoon, and uh, pleased to be here at Coptic Orthodox Answers this afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to wait a few minutes to give folks a chance to, to get logged on and joining us, uh, but thrilled to be with you all today. And uh, just while we're, we're getting started, uh, and I'll repeat this probably one more time, there are, uh, I'm sure, going to be a number of questions uh, that pop up. I'd, I'd encourage you, if you could, uh, to just include and hold off on the questions until the very end. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to scroll back through the, uh, the question part of it and uh, might throw me off a little bit while we're, we're talking uh, today in, in the, the first part of the, the session. So um, welcome, welcome. If anyone wants to, uh, who's joining on, just uh, give us an idea of where you're you're joining us from, and we'll just wait a couple minutes to to get started here. Give a a chance for folks to join us. Juliana Colada, great to see you on here. Good afternoon. Pleased to be with you. Paul Benjamin from Jersey. Good to see you on here. Paul's a, a good friend of mine. Pleased to always see you. Uh, it's been been a while. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started in just uh, another minute. But reminder, uh, if questions pop up, uh, please be sure to uh, put them in the comment section uh, closer to the end of, uh, of, of our session, uh, just so I don't have to scroll back up uh, through uh, the, uh, the, the, the comment section. So I uh, see someone already posted a question. I'm excited to get to that question, uh, but we'll discuss that. Uh, preferably near the end. Uh, also, as far as the questions go, if you could try uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll try to cover the questions that relate to the topic today first, and then if, uh, as time allows, I'll get to the other questions as well. Uh, Peter Holt from Sweden, uh, happy to have you on here with us. Uh, oh, my son Elijah's on here, my my six-year-old man. It's, uh, this is going to be a tough crowd today. To, to have to speak uh, to my six-year-old, but, um, you know, I think he'll be able to keep up. All right, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, I'm Father Michael Soriel, the priest at St. Nana's Coptic Orthodox Church, and, uh, and, and I'm really thrilled to be here uh, with uh, COA. Uh, Father Anthony Murad and Father Gabriel Wisa are dear friends of mine. Uh, I was uh, with them kind of as the, the, the whole COA uh, process was being birthed. It was still just a, a brainchild for them. And uh, I am so thrilled to see how far uh, Coptic Orthodox Answers has grown, uh, the reach of this ministry and, uh, and the depth of the teaching of uh, these two great fathers and, and this platform of having such live events. So uh, thrilled to be with you all. Today, the, t today our topic is church in crisis, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first portion uh, and unpack the topic about the church in crisis, which is a a very timely topic, and then the second portion uh, we'll be going through some questions, and I'll uh, open it up. If there are any questions, you can once again put them in the live chat, and please, last time I'm going to say this is just if you could put them in the comment section um, in the live chat near the end when we're approaching the time of uh, discussion. So uh, today's topic is church in crisis. And uh, it's, it is such a prevalent 
uh, and relevant topic uh, for us to be discussing today, especially as the entire world uh, is in crisis. Uh, nine weeks ago, our world shut down, uh, more or less. All over the world, this, this pandemic, this uh, coronavirus pandemic, has brought the world to a screeching halt. And just like any and every other institution, the church has been responding and trying to determine how do we as a church respond in times of crisis like this. So about six weeks ago, if I could fast forward three weeks from the start of the pandemic, uh, I was part of this COVID-19 task force for the Coptic Orthodox Archdiocese uh, in New Jersey and uh, in, in collaboration with the Diocese of New York, New England. And we were meeting regularly to discuss and plan how are we going to move forward uh, with this whole response to the pandemic. And so we were meeting on a weekly basis, um, sometimes multiple times a week, and discussing and exploring what should the response of the church be? How can we as leadership provide the best response uh, for the church, for the faithful, and do so in a way that reflects to the world who we are as the body uh, of Christ, that's consistent with our 2,000-year witness as a church. As we were going through the, the discussions, it kind of struck me that we were having a lot of discussions about uh, the pastoral aspect for uh, the faithful. We were talking about the legal aspects. Uh, we were even discussing the medical and ethical aspects and what we should do in each of those areas. But it struck me that there was an entire section, an entire area that we were neglecting to look at, which was the historical precedence of our 2000 year church, how has the church responded historically in times of crisis? And number two is, was there any theological dimension that we were not paying attention to uh, that if we didn't, then there could be some great loss uh, for the faithful moving forward. So the, the, that began my research. Uh, His Grace Bishop David had encouraged me to start doing research and to report back to the fathers uh, for the next week, I immersed myself into uh, doing research. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention what's been the product of that research uh, at the end of uh, the lecture today. So uh, history has always been in a state of, of chaos and crisis. Ever since the fall of humanity in the garden, it has been very clear and evident to me uh, through the research, that history has been in one state of crisis after the next. Uh, and as a result of the fall, you now have disease and death, natural disasters, uh, and all sorts of evil, and whether natural or unnatural, human-inspired uh, or natural, that are uh, impacting the entire human race and in the entire world, uh, for that, that matter. But the interesting thing about crisis is that extreme crisis always tends to have the ability to unearth certain hidden issues and unseen symptoms within the, the soul. So in other words, what we're in the middle of right now is this external crisis, COVID-19. The world is on lockdown. People don't know what they're going to do as far as work. People are exhausted, fatigued from being alone. There's a mental health crisis uh, that is coming about as a, a result of people being isolated for, for weeks or months. And for a number of people, they're also having a crisis of faith. But that brings us to the internal one, which is that crisis of faith. So these external crises, which we're in the middle of, oftentimes has a way of unearthing an internal crisis, which is what I'm going to really focus on, which is the crisis of faith that I have been seeing around me for these last several weeks. The external, put very simply, the external crisis tends to reveal internal cracks. If you look at a marriage as an example, marriages will oftentimes look really healthy and really positive, but the moment there is stress, in the marriage, in the relationship, that will oftentimes expose internal cracks 
to that marriage, to that family that weren't realized before when things were okay, right? You've heard the old saying, money doesn't buy happiness, but the absence of money can oftentimes expose internal cracks within a family or a couple that might not have been seen or understood before. What is the crisis of faith we're going to be looking and speaking about today? Especially for the Orthodox Church that steeps ourselves in being an unchanging church and unchanging faith, this time has been exceptionally difficult because the world around us is going through an extraordinarily rapid rate of change, right? Things are happening on a daily basis. If I could go back to March 14th, um, we had, as an archdiocese and diocese here in the Northeast, had determined that we were going to put out a press release, uh, suspending certain services, modifying, including social distancing, modifying how we were going to gather. And then within 48 hours, we had to put out yet another statement, realizing the rapidly evolving and changing nature of the situation that we're in. Now, this can be exceptionally difficult for a community like ours that is steeped in saying, we don't change. We've always been the same. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at and sharing about, sharing out today. Some of the questions that were coming up is, how long will this go on for? Is this the end of the world? Is God pouring out his wrath on us? When will we be able to take communion again? Right? And these were all sorts of questions that were arising from within that the, the, the were perhaps coming out of those cracks inside of people that were caused by the external pressures, the external crisis of our current situation. And one of the other challenges or obstacles that people were facing was this idea of virtual church. Some are struggling with it today, and some are thinking forward and projecting out if we continue in the same manner for another several weeks or months, what does that do to the spiritual psyche of the individual and the community? And so these are matters of crisis that we as a church have to dig into and think about and expose and uncover. Some of the Eucharistic questions that were coming up, is it acceptable for a member of the clergy to hold a private liturgy? Is it okay for me to pray liturgy by myself? And what exactly constitutes a private liturgy? Is it okay for the clergy to gather and pray without the congregation, the body? And if one, if one doesn't commune for a specified period of time, what risks are involved, if any, right? There, there's certain ideas that we just kind of took for granted. I have heard people say repeatedly, that um, if you don't take communion for 40 days, an evil spirit's going to come inside of you. And so this folkloric idea has begun to be exposed and unearthed, and people are now facing this, uh, some of these questions and having to, to, to dig a little bit deeper into the substance of the faith, the essence of our faith, rather than just focusing exclusively on the form, right? The shell, the rites what it is that we do, how does we communicate the faith. People are now kind of digging through and saying, how do we parse it out and apply this in our own lives? Should the church continue to stream liturgical services? If so, which segments are acceptable to stream and which portions should we not stream and why? Has the church always distributed communion in the current methodology? If not, how has it been done in the past? And lastly, if the churches were to temporarily modify Eucharistic distributions, what forms should she consider and how would she come back from that modification? So these were all questions that people were starting to ask and wrestle with. And uh, these can be really matters of crisis for a community such as the Orthodox Church that is steeped in, we don't change. I mean, for the love of God, the name of our church signifies that we do not 
change. But what is it that we don't change in? And that's what we want to focus on and unpack today uh, as time allows. One of the key aspects that we uh, have to dig into, because this is where we get our identity from as a church and our value, it reveals and exposes our value is Eucharist, how we view the Eucharist and the connection between the Eucharist and Christology with our understanding of our practice and our ecclesiology. In other words, the connection between Christ and his church, the body of his body, the, the, the body of Christ, the church, and the Eucharist and how we practice that uh, and express it in our community together. St. Irenaeus of Leones, he's a, a late second century uh, bishop. He stated that our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, in turn, confirms our way of thinking. What we think about the Eucharist has a profound impact uh, on who we see ourselves to be, right? There's a direct connection between the Eucharist and the church and how those two uh, not only express one another, but uh, reveal what it is that we think about uh, the other. So Eucharistic distributions that, uh, that we have to be mindful of, especially and are unearthed during these times of crisis, are three in particular. Number one is the magical aspect. Number two is the mechanical aspect. And number three is the amulet aspect. The, the first is the magical aspect. And these are Eucharistic distortions. The magical aspect is that people oftentimes view the Eucharist as a magical tool that they have to take in order to protect them from devils. Otherwise, if they don't, they will be possessed by devils. Number two is the mechanical aspect. And the mechanical aspect says this, that if I simply just take the Eucharist, it doesn't matter where my heart is, where my mind is, mechanically something inside of me will be changed. And that stands antithetical to our understanding of our soteriology, our, our salvation uh, theology, how we view our encounter with God's grace in partnership with our will. And the third, uh, the third distortion is the lucky amulet view. And the lucky amulet view says that if I simply take communion before a big exam, before uh, 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 an interview, uh, or before uh, uh, some special project that I have, that I will find success through uh, any endeavor that I have, so long as I have taken my lucky amulet. And quite frankly, this stands completely antithetically to our understanding of the Eucharist historically. Just a very cursory reading of the Eucharist shows us that the church, number one, has seen the Eucharist as its central act of worship. And number two is that the primary understanding and reason and purpose for the Eucharist was union with God and union with one another. Union with God and union with one another. In other words, when Christ says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that the two are, in, in fact, connected to one another. And the same goes for our understanding of the Eucharist, that through our union with God, that it's through union with him, which is our purpose, our goal, and the reason why we become the image of God through union with him, that we also become in union with one another that we're able to share in this intimacy that is far greater and beyond anything that we could humanly imagine. And so as we're kind of going through this crisis, it's unearthed for us some of these Eucharistic distortions and revealing for us some truths, some gems of what it is that we're actually hungry and thirsting for. I believe when I hear people saying, I miss being in church, what they're saying is, I miss being able to commune with God eucharistically. They're not saying, I miss being in church so that I can pass an exam, right? No, they're saying, I desire to commune with God 
and I miss the ability to assemble with the body of Christ. The Greek word ekklesia means to be called out, to be assembled from all places, from all over. And this is an image that we find very clearly in the Didache. The Didache uh, is, a, is a late first century document, uh, Christian literature, that speaks about a number of early Christian practices, one of them being the Eucharist. And in the language of the Didache, uh, you find this, this imagery of all nations coming from all over, just as wheat would be gathered from all the, the hills and mountains and come together and be ground up and make one loaf, one body. And this is what we as the church are to do. We're to become one with God and one with one another. Our intimacy with God is in knowing him personally. And we have a true and beautiful intimacy with one another that is pure and holy and that's reflected eucharistically. One of the other things that was exposed through this time of crisis that we're in is that as people began to ask some of these questions and we're having this crisis of faith was what if, what if we're not able to commune? Or what if we have to come up with a different methodology whether it's giving the body only without the, 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 the spoon, the mystere, or dipping the body into the blood and giving it and distributing it, right? So these are some of the questions that people were wrestling with. What if we make any change? Is that problematic for us? Does, have we suddenly become not orthodox? God forbid. It is very clear from church history that we belong to a tradition of diversity tradition of diversity. And I'll just highlight two specific ways eucharistically that we find this tradition of diversity. The first is in the order of communion, the order that we distribute communion. Okay. And we've gone through a number of iterations on this. Probably the earliest stated document about the order of distribution you find in the Apostolic Constitution, which is in the year 380 AD. And at that time, the apostolic constitution is clear. First, the bishop communes, then the priests, then the deacons, then the ranks of the deacons. And then afterwards, uh, from you would have the um, from amongst the women, you would have the, uh, the, the virgins and the widows. And then lastly, the possibly the children. And then after that, the men and the women in order. OK, so that's the apostolic constitution. But in the 13th century. We have one of our popes named Cyril III, Ibn Lukluk, and he is around the year 1235, 1243. That's when his papacy is. It's during that time that you find that the priest uh, is instructed to give communion to the bishops, right? And that's a distinction from how we practice today and how the practice was done in the apostolic constitution. But then he gives an exception that... If the bishop of the city is there, then he first communes, and then the priest distributes to the others, okay? And then, of course, we have our modern practice of the bishop, and then the priest, and then the deacons, the, the what people popularly refer to as consecrated deacons. And then you have the other ranks who are serving the altar, and then usually the, the, the rest of the ranks of the deacons outside, and then the the men and the women, some churches will do children first. So, so that's the order and some diversity that we've seen historically with the order of distribution. As far as the methodology of communion delivery, we also have a great deal of diversity uh, in the distribution of the Eucharist. Uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical letters, uh, a catechesis just means to instruct or initiate one into the church. In his catechetical letters, he actually instructs the people to, as they come forward, to put their right hand first and then their left hand. And he says, making a throne that is um, reflecting the honor of the king that we're about to receive, receive him. And then they would cover, take the, the Eucharist, um, the consecrated uh, bread, the body, and they would consume it. In the, the, the fourth century, near the end of the fourth century, you have a, a, a different practice where the laity and the desert hermits in Egypt were instructed to commune themselves at home. 
And then you have in the fifth century, St. Shenouda, who was one of the, the abbots of the monastery of the, the white monastery. Uh, he instructs his monks to receive communion also in their hands. There were other times where the spoon was given with the body and the blood already on it. And then, of course, we have our contemporary, our most modern practice that falls within the tradition of diversity of how we practice today. So what I'm not posing for either, the order or the distribution, is an outright change uh, universally. But what I am proposing and suggesting and highlighting is this tradition of diversity within the church. And the tradition of diversity was essential to engage with the needs of the time and the context of the situation. There were the essentials and the variables. The essential was the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The variable was how it would be distributed and in what order it would be distributed. You have the essence of the faith is that God has revealed himself to us. He's offering himself to us in order to unite himself to us so that we might be saved through the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, to all those who partake of him, right? But the form, we find some diversity historically. In other words, put differently, the what and the why were essential. These were uncompromising. But the how, we have some diversity and some variety uh, that fits within our tradition of diversity. In this last part, I just want to highlight that the church has gone through a number of series of crises in the past. And I'm just going to mention three categories of these crises. The first are plagues, the second are famines, and the third are eras of persecution. And just for the sake of today's discussion, I'm just going to give one or two examples for each of those categories. And I'll tell you where you can find more information on those later, okay? And the reason being is because what we find is that the church in each of those time periods and situations responded according to the needs and the context of their situation. The first we find are the plagues. And I'll just mention two quickly, the plague of Saint, uh, the, the, what's referred to as the Cyprian plague or the plague of Cyprian, which is in the middle of the third century, 250 AD, where thousands of people were dying every single day. But what you find here is an instruction from Cyprian to the faithful to continue to be faithful and to live in light of their immortality in Christ. He wrote a, a, a beautiful treatise called On Mortality, where he reminds them that we live and that the just die just like the unjust do, that we don't receive some special treatment because we um, are members in the body of Christ. We don't receive a special protection against the plague. No, our protection is the eternal vaccine that we've received in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the second thing that you find with Cyprian is an instruction to the faithful to go out and to serve and how it is that the faithful, through their service to the world, revealed the light of Jesus Christ. The second example is a plague referred to as called the Great Plague. And this is in the 14th century from 1347 to 1351, wiped out over 100 million people throughout Europe. And when it came to Egypt, you find that the Copts responded to that specific plague through the establishment of what we now practice as the general funeral rite, okay? And the general funeral rite at one point began on Palm Sunday and went all the way through the Holy 50, the Chamasim, okay? And the reason being is that time of year for those four years was the worst time of year uh, for uh, the, the, the impact of the plague. And so they introduced it and it continued uh, thereafter. The second category is famines. And I'll just mention a couple famines. The first was during the seventh century, the time of Pope Benjamin I. And the, the, uh, the, the manuscripts revealed that the people were dying by the hundreds daily, and they were basically being thrown out into the streets and by the Nile. I mean, people were dying in huge numbers uh, in these uh, towns and villages and cities. 
And so what the church did as a response to that was begin to practice mass burials. And they also allowed for the first time for funerals to be performed on Sundays. Why? Because people were dying every single day by the hundreds and the faithful needed to bury their dead and to do so in a way that was honoring and uh, respectful to them. The other example that I want to give is in the ninth century. In the ninth century, the, the famine that struck uh, Egypt at that time, not exclusively, but did when it hit Egypt, the people in their writings did not believe this and didn't see this as an act of God's anger towards them, but rather they saw it as an act of mercy and God's righteous love to them. Okay, so this was their response historically to the crisis that happened then. They weren't looking up and saying, God, why are you angry? Why are you pouring out wrath? No, they said, God, we know that you love us and whatever is happening, you will use it for the sake of our salvation. And the last are persecutions. And there's probably a couple of dozen times of persecution where the church doors had to be closed for extended periods of time. One of the longest ones being nine years uh, during the, the, the reign of uh, the caliph, uh, uh, Ibn, uh, uh, Ibn, uh, the caliph uh, in the, the beginning of the 10th century, his name uh, is uh, escaping my meme right now. Ibn, Amr ibn Allah, Amr ibn Allah, the caliph. Uh, he was the sixth caliph in the Fatimid uh, empire. And during his time, he closes the church for nine years. But I'm going to mention two lesser known times of persecution. The first is during the time of P Pope Fionis. During the time of Pope Fionis, who's a, a, the Pope right before Pope Peter, the seal of martyrs. Uh, so at the end of the four, uh, third century, the Christians were forced to go into hiding. And as a result of going into hiding, what happened was they prayed they engaged in time of worship, they received communion, and they baptized their children and adults in caves, mountains, and other hidden places. They were forced to go into hiding. The second example is during the time of Pope Cosmos. And during the time of Pope Cosmos II in the ninth century, the Christians were forbidden from using wine. The, the, the governor at the time, he closed uh, and, and forbid any use of wine. And basically, if you did, you would be killed. And so what the church did under the teaching and the leadership of Cosmos II, the Pope instructed the faithful to take the grape vines, soak them in water, and use the extract from that as an oil or juice that would then be used as an offering. Cosmos had to be creative. Rather than saying... We're going to close the churches for the next three years, or however long this might go on for. Cosmos temporarily utilized that as an exception. And then when the period passed, they went back to using wine as we do today. So just a few recommendations during our time of crisis, and then we will come to questions in the next five minutes. So just three categories I want to focus on. The first are the theological and spiritual Second are the liturgical, and the third are how we can serve the world today. The first, theological and spiritual. We want to be very careful, just like our ancestors, to avoid attempting to be the mouthpiece of God, making ourselves as prophets who are looking to interpret specific events today and saying God is doing this for this reason. I've heard numerous people out there claiming that God is angry with humanity, and that's why this is happening. He's pouring out his wrath. Quite honestly, we don't know the exact reason why God is allowing this, uh, but what we do know is that the faithful, regardless of what happened in the past, the faithful always looked up to God and said, we accept whatever comes, Lord, because our lives are not reduced to this temporal time, right? We are the most pitiful people if Christ is not risen from the dead, but if he is risen from the dead unmistakably, then our life is hidden in Christ and our life is hidden in the heavens. Christians were not living for today. They weren't living to store up treasures on earth. No, they were living to store up treasures in heaven. 
we need to be very careful theologically that we avoid interpreting current crisis as a result of God's wrath and anger. We do not know, okay? What we do know about God is who he is, and that should always dictate our understanding and how we view current circumstances, that God is always pursuing humanity, that ever since the fall, disease and death have plagued the human race. But God, out of his infinite love for us, pursued us. And if we would just turn our hearts and our lives back to him and unite ourselves to him, then we will experience and have eternal life in him. Number two is the liturgical life. There is nothing more reflective of our values and identity than our liturgical worship. And the word liturgy means the work of the people. It is your work. It's not the work of a priest or a bishop and a few deacons. It is the work of the body. It is the work of the church. And so one of the things that we need to begin to do is reestablish during this time of crisis that's been going on for at least a few months and impacting our lives for at least the last two months and change. Most churches being closed. We need to go back to reestablishing a pattern of worship in our homes that includes a rhythm with the Bible and offering up sacrifice of praise and praying the hours, having quiet time, engaging in Lectio Divina or meditating on the word, engaging in service to our family and those beyond. And lastly, is examining ourselves. We also need to think about the practice of streaming uh, our liturgical services, specifically the liturgy of the faithful. And I can address more of that if there are questions during the discussion section. The last thing that I want to mention here is, as far as Eucharistic accommodations, we have to acknowledge, just as during the time of Cosmos II, if this period goes on uh, for much longer, there are certain questions and conversations around accommodations that the faithful have already begun doing and will continue doing. Some of those include uh, dipping the body and the blood and then distributing directly into the mouth of the person. For others, they've talked about opening and dropping and taking the spoon and dripping into the mouth of the person, right? So, so there's already some of those conversations that are happening here. And what we want to be careful of is that we don't categorize people based on their own comfort or discomfort or questioning around certain things related to the Eucharist. No one is claiming that uh, disease can be communicated through the communion. But what we have to acknowledge about this specific time of crisis is that it can happen, of course, during communion, right? I mean, if air particles are out there uh, in the uh, um, that that can get someone infected or sick, it can happen certainly in a church, and we would be foolish to ignore times in past where people, faithful Christians, have gone to church during times where <clears throat> they were uh, no, they knew that they were under attack, and yet they went to church and they were killed uh, in the church by attackers who were coming to kill them. Right? One would say, well, of course God would protect them. God has secured and protected their soul. And these faithful said, we're willing to go. and But yet we're going to uh, die and live in Christ. To live is Christ and to die uh, is gain. We need to be careful to avoid categorizing people and remembering we have a tradition of diversity. With respect to the Eucharist, Orthodox Christians have always understood that they could be flexible in the how, the manner in which communion was distributed, while remaining unwavering on the what, giving the body and the blood of Christ for the why, for the sake of salvation. Okay, that's number two. Number three, and I'll close up with this, is serving the world. Liturgy after the liturgy. The faithful, my friends, have always sought to be and shine the light of Jesus Christ in every Era. Liturgy does not conclude when the priest sends the people 
in the world. He is commissioning the people to go in peace. He summons them to continue liturgy in the world. St. Cyprian, in his work on mortality, he says the following, the just are dying with the unjust. It is not for you to think that the destruction is a common one for both the evil and the good. How suitable, how necessary it is that this plague and pestilence, which seems horrible and deadly, searches out the justice of each and examines the mind of the human race, whether the well care for the sick, whether relatives dutifully love their kinsmen as they should, whether masters show compassion for their ailing slaves, whether physicians do not desert the afflicted. The faithful have always sought ways to serve their neighbors, their family, their community, and the world in their times of crisis. And today, the church needs to be creative about doing the same. I was thrilled when His Holiness Pope Tuadros, when the churches were closed, converted all the churches and monasteries into places where they could manufacture masks, which would then be distributed to the general public. All of our churches, each Christian in their home, should be thinking about making ear savers for the, the, the uh, uh, mental health or the, the, the health care workers, preparing meals for our first responders, doing shopping in a safe way for the immunocompromised and elderly and a number of other services as well. Every incident of crisis in the past demanded a different response, and the church was not afraid to take those drastic steps to respond to the needs of the day. Today, in addition to being faithful to our witness, we need to be faithful to repenting and returning to our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, we're reminded that if God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive the sins and heal their land. Maybe when we repent, when we seek out Christ, when we unite ourselves to him, that God will use us to heal the souls of our neighbors. May God give us the grace to do so and all glory be to his name forever. Amen. Just uh, at this point, I'm going to take questions. If you've already typed up questions, I would ask you to re-place uh, them back in the, the live chat so I don't have to scroll up. While you're doing that, I'm going to explain a little bit more, uh, just in 60 seconds, uh, a little bit more about this research and, and where you can find it. As I mentioned six weeks ago, I started on this journey of uh, researching and, and uh, help to, in order to help serve the church during this time of crisis. And um, because the research was so well received, uh, I was asked to provide it in a publishable manner. And that journey has finally come uh, to a close. Uh, I'll be publishing, God willing, uh, through Agora University, the book called uh, Church Life in a Coronavirus World. Church Life in a Coronavirus World, Lessons from Past Plagues, Famines, and Years of per Persecution for Today And it goes through uh, what I've discussed today, as well as a whole breadth uh, of more information that I hope will be useful uh, for each and every one of you. Okay. Uh, Bernadette Feltas asks, how do we know that Christianity is the one true religion and that all others are not authentic? And Peter is saying, I'm struggling to understand God's role in things like crisis versus our own. May Many Christians say, trust God, but does it mean we don't need to protect ourselves against crisis, but only rely on prayers? Two really good questions. Uh, Bernadette, I'll begin with, uh, with your question first. How do we know that Christianity is the one true religion and that all others are not authentic? What we know to be true, the, 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 the most true fact uh, and genuine uh, event in human history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if we were simply comparing Christianity to other religions based on teaching uh, and belief system, one might say there are some similarities. But what distinguishes Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the resurrection of Christ authenticates everything else 
in the gospel. That in fact, if Christ is risen from the dead, and this is what St. Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is risen from the dead, then everything else in the gospel is true. And what we know to be true is that Christ was crucified, he was killed, he was buried, and the tomb was empty. And that the disciples went around preaching and giving their lives and sacrificing for what they believed to be truly a witness, firsthand encounter of the risen Christ. 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred, and the 12th uh, died in exile, all for preaching that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Today, just as uh, God would have it, today uh, I just finished teaching uh, a lesson on this called Unmistakably Risen, uh, and it's titled Faith. It's on uh, our church's YouTube page, St. Anianus. Uh, you can find it uploaded there. And I give seven examples or evidences for the resurrection. And it's so important and critical for us because if Christ is risen, then that impacts everything else. And no longer is Christianity just a religion amongst religion, but truly Christ is revealed as the God who stands out uh, from anyone else. He is true God. And the others, and sorry to use such a, um, a difficult word, but others are fraudulent. Others are not true. But Christ is truly the Son of God in the flesh. Uh, next question, Peter. I'm struggling to understand God's role in things like crisis versus our own. I think you're, you're saying God's role versus our role uh, in things like crisis. And many Christians say, trust God, but does it mean we don't need to protect ourselves against crisis, but only rely on prayer? Excellent, excellent question. So God's role is, is, is a couple of things. Number one is God, in the very beginning, he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And as a result of Adam and Eve being disobedient, humanity by extension, each and every day, we, we continue to uh, reject God's call to us. Disease and death were introduced into the cosmos. And as a consequence of that, we have all kinds of destruction and chaos that happen and have been happening in the world. Now, we have to distinguish between things that are uh, happening as a consequence of the created order, the natural order that has come about as a result of God's will, God's word, God's command, that if you eat of this, you will surely die. So we have to distinguish between that and the second, which is uh, human's role in perpetuating evil and destruction in the world. Okay, And so we have to distinguish between those two things. And in general, when dealing with crisis, we can understand that the first category, uh, the, the Christians at the time of the ninth century famine, they accepted anything that happened in a natural sense. They said, God, we are trusting that you are allowing this as an act of mercy for our salvation, right? Because during these times, what are we reminded of? We're reminded of our own mortality. The Psalms tell us, teach a man to number his days that he may gain a heart of wisdom. And St. Anthony, in his first letter, he reminds us, he reminds the reader that during times of crisis, that those who are Christians, that are faithful, that are zealous, are prepared to be martyrs for Christ. They're willing to do anything for the sake of Christ. And those who are kind of on the fence, they become true saints if they begin to search for Christ. And those who are kind of not thinking about God at all, they begin to think about Christ and are drawn to him. So I believe God is using this, even though he uh, may not be the, the cause of it, he's using it to draw humanity back to him. And that starts with each and every one of us. Now, the second question that you asked was trusting God. Does that mean we don't need to protect ourselves against crisis, but only rely on prayers? No, absolutely not. I mean, we, we, God has created us as rational beings with minds to observe and interact with the world. And we use those minds uh, scientifically and faith together. They don't conflict with one another. So if I know that washing my hands is going to help protect me or wearing a mask is going to help protect me and others, then I am willing to do so uh, as an act of faith 
knowing that God has created this, uh, uh, this, the cosmos and the system, even that we have destroyed it and made it diseased, God has still uh, created it and he's provided all things for the sake of our salvation. So we continue to do that, which is protective for ourselves and for others as an act of love as and as an act of faith. Uh, Saba is asking, she says, hello, uh, Abuna from Ethiopia. Glad to be on here with you. Uh, the church is not closed here. We pray saying the cross is our healer strength. So priests say that we should continue kissing the cross and Bible, but could hinder crisis. Uh, I mean, that's a, a fair thing in Ethiopia. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but I, I know that here uh, in, in the U.S. and in Canada, uh, as well as in Egypt and other parts of the world, there have been time. Um, all of most of the churches have instructed the faithful uh, to stay home, to help mitigate uh, the, the the spread of the disease, uh, and that even when we return, that we would not be kissing uh, icons uh, and crosses. That we believe that truly the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, risen from the dead, He is the healer. And so when we kiss the cross or we kiss an icon, we do so directing it not to the substance, but we direct it to the one to whom the substance depicts. So when we kiss the cross or when we're able to kiss the cross or we, if you will, blow kisses to the cross, what we're saying there is in reality, this uh, adornment, this love, this gratitude is offered to the healer, our Lord Jesus Christ. Bernadette saying, I'm sorry, but what is the name of the site where you publish the proofs uh, for the resurrection? It's on our uh, the church's YouTube page. It's uh, Saint uh, N-E-N-S A-N-I. Uh, I'll just type it in here for you. That'll be easier. That's our, uh, I just posted the, the church's YouTube page where you can find the video on there. So this situation, what are we supposed to do? How do we be faithful and fearful, but also do what is expected of us to be protected? I think that is an excellent question. Um, I think what we are to do in being faithful is trusting God, knowing that our lives are hidden in Christ, that our life is in heaven, that our eternity is what we're living for is not here. It's in the heavens. But at the same time, uh, through serving God and serving one another, what we do is we think of creative ways to serve the world. One of the beautiful things that we find throughout church history is that always after time of crisis, the church would grow. And the church grew because the faithful remain that way spiritually and theologically. They remain that way liturgically. And they remain that way through the liturgy after the liturgy. Even when the doors of the church were closed, they had liturgy in their homes. They prayed in their homes. They worshiped God in their homes. They read the scripture in their home. And then they continued the liturgy after the liturgy by serving in the world. We have to be creative about doing so in such a way that also acknowledges and respects the governing authorities. And so, yes, we can do so in ways like preparing meals. Uh, for first responders or uh, making ear savers. We had young children making bracelets uh, in our in our parish with the names of, with, with phrases like hope and love uh, and God loves you on them. And then we would distribute them to hospitals, to uh, doctors and nurses uh, and those who were uh, in quarantine. So we can be faithful uh, by continuing to, to walk with God, to seek God out and the reason and, and to serve God in one another, and we avoid fear by holding on to the truth that our lives here are temporary. I mean, if 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 we are only living for here, then it means that we don't really believe that Christ is risen from the dead. And so I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, to uh, rest in that truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that, I believe, will... Uh, help secure your own faithfulness in the, the presence of fear. Now, at the same time, we need to be mindful to not be reckless and careless, uh, to, to, to not spread the disease to others. 
So we have a responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to the world around us, to the community around us, to our neighbors, to do that which will be responsible and Christ-like, which requires sacrifice. It requires the cross. And when we're willing to carry the cross and sacrifice our wants and desires and comforts, it will provide healing for the sake of others. Okay, there's another question here. It says, um, hello, this is Daniel from Nebraska. I'm inquiring, uh, Orthodox, I have a question regarding sin and Mary. I accept and understand the fact that we do not inherit the guilt of the sin of Adam. Did Mary have sin? So if we understand sin to be missing the mark, then regardless if she had uh, sin or not, if she had, I think when you say had sin, I think you're saying, did she commit sin? I think what we acknowledge is that all have sinned, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we all have sinned, the disease of sin inside of us. And as a result of that, death was swallowing us up. And as a consequence of that, we needed God to come in the flesh and unite himself to us to heal our nature. I would encourage you to check out the book On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius. And it goes through wonderfully and masterfully and speaks about our need of salvation uh, through the union of life with our corrupted nature. And that included, of course, uh, the beloved Virgin St. Mary. How can we interpret when we feel like our prayers are not answered? When can we be sure our prayers will be answered or is in a not answered prayer part of uh, God's plan is how can we know um, if our prayers are going unanswered? I think part of it is also us seeking to mature in our uh, what it is that we're asking and seeking after. Uh, just uh, last week, I was so humbled. Uh, my my six year old son. We were in prayer, and uh, and it struck me as he was praying. He just, he simply said, God, thank you for uh, the fact that we could stand and worship you and pray to you. And then he began to pray for uh, the healing and help of other people. Um, and afterwards, I told him, I commented, I said, that was, I've, I was really like humbled and uh, encouraged uh, by the maturity of his prayers. Um, he, it, it shows the childlike innocence where we, Simply say, God, I trust you. I put myself into your hands. And I know, like, I'm going to seek out certain things. But if there are things that are not from you, Lord, please close the door. Because ultimately what I want is your name, or is your will. That's the reason why when we pray things in the name of Christ, what we're saying is, Lord, I want that which will bring me closer into, um, uh, into uh, communion with you. I want that which will help reflect your image uh, in my life. So if we're seeking something out and the door keeps getting shut, either perhaps I'm not equipped for such a task or that's not something that may be um, uh, for the sake of my salvation. I would encourage you that as you're praying uh, to above all else, ask God, Lord, is this for the sake of my salvation? Will this draw me closer to you. I used to encourage uh, previous youth groups that I, I, I served with, our college youth, when they're praying about a university, I would tell them, guys, just simply pray, if me going to that university uh, is going to draw me closer to you, God, then let me, like, give me peace about going there. Uh, sometimes you have two really good options, and you have to decide between two good options. Uh, and so a significant and starting place, starting point place uh, for our prayer should be the sake of our salvation. Will I be saved? Will I draw closer to God uh, through the process of um, whatever it is that I'm, I'm looking at or pursuing? Whether it's a relationship, it's a job, uh, it's a university that I want to go to, uh, or a, a service that I would, I'm, I'm desiring to endeavor and pursue, okay? I have really enjoyed uh, being with you all this uh, this afternoon. Uh, once again,
I have just typed for you the uh, the name of the book. You can check it out in Amazon on uh, Wednesday. It should be up. Uh, and you can, I'd love to hear from you if you, once you get a chance to read it, uh, post a review, uh, reach out to me, and I'd love to hear uh, back from you your thoughts uh, on that. God bless you, and uh, praying that the resurrection of Christ would truly be revealed uh, in each of our lives, and that during this time of crisis, we continue to shine with the light of the risen Christ. God bless you.